This is Mike Grell, and you're listening to Warlord Worlds. Welcome to a very special episode of Warlord Worlds, a fan podcast devoted to the comic creations of Mike Grell, including The Warlord, John Sable, Green Arrow, and more. I'm Darren. And I'm Ruth. We're recording at Lexington Comic Con, and we have a very special guest joining us today, the creator of everything we talk about on Warlord Worlds, Mike Grell. Thank you for joining us, Mike. It's nice to be here. So this is the 30th anniversary of your classic miniseries, Green Arrow, The Longbow Hunters. So we thought it was a perfect time to talk about your work with that character. You worked on Green Arrow in backup stories and in the Green Lantern and Green Arrow series earlier. So before we get to the Longbow Hunters, tell us about how you first got started working with Green Arrow. It was answered to a dream, actually. Green Arrow is the character that got me the most interested in comics. It's always been my favorite. From the time I was a little kid, I ran around with a stick bow and a homemade arrow was stuck down the back of my shirt. If you look at the Longbow Hunters, you'll see a panel that has a little kid running around doing exactly that. Well, that was me. Um, Didn't have any trick arrows. The the trick was to not shoot each other's eyes out, I guess. (laughs) But the character Green Arrow was always intriguing to me, especially in the Green Lantern Green Arrow comic, because it made a perfect counterpart to Green Lantern. Green Arrow is uh, essentially Robin Hood. He's a, he's a modern-day Robin Hood, in, in my view. He is the spirit of justice, while Green Lantern is the letter of the law. I am the law, the law, the law, the law, the law. And Oliver Queen is more the type of guy to just go, you know what, this is a bad guy and something's got to be done here. So when I was drawing the backup stories, I had a couple of issues that, that cropped up. One with Julie Schwartz. When I was given a line in a book, I think Elliot Magan wrote it, and it was a line of dialogue where Green Arrow says, I'm not even 30 yet. And I went, whoa, hold on for just a second. And Julie said, no, none of our characters are, are over 30 because our readers can't relate to anybody over 30 years old. And I said, okay, let me ask you this. How old is... Speedy, he said, oh, he's 15 or 16. They said, how long have he and Oliver Queen been together? How long has he been Oliver Queen's ward? And he said, probably six or eight years. And I said, same thing for Batman? And he goes, yeah. And I went, okay, so you mean to tell me that any court in the world is going to give custodial guardianship of young not even teenage boy to a 24 year old millionaire <laughs> and, and he went okay well we just won't mention the, the actual age so from that point on it became my personal agenda to not only mention my characters ages but make them age as the series wore on right. I did it with everybody and when the time came to do the Longbow Hunters I made sure that Oliver Queen was older, turning 40, because I was not 40 yet. <laughs> I made him just a little older than I was. And, and from, from that point, uh, what else happened was that I happened to be in the D.C. offices when Danny O'Neill announced that he was going to resurrect the Green Lantern, Green Arrow title. And I marched straight to his office and said, okay, who do I have to kill? And, and Denny said, okay, if you want it that bad, just put the gun down and the job is yours. But right prior to that, I had I had written a story that was done as a, as a backup, and Elliot Magnum was going to do the, the dialogue, I did the plot, 
worked it out, pitched it to Julie Schwartz, the editor, and it had to do with a female counterpart to Green Arrow. I was going to call her the Black Arrow, and she was a Holocaust survivor, and she's basically tracking down and slaughtering Nazi war criminals who had been brought over to the United States at the end of the war under Operation Paperclip, where so many of the Nazi scientists had had jumped ship and, and were working on our side. It's how we got Warner Von Braun for the space program. And Julie said, oh, I got a better idea. See, it, it, it's it's not a girl. It's a young boy. And instead of a bow and arrow, he's using a sling. And he's the reincarnation of King David. Okay. If that's the story you want to do, go ahead and do it. But I don't want to write it. So I took my story and put it in the file cabinet. And about 12 years later, Mike Gold called me up and asked me if there was any character at D.C. I liked well enough to bury the hatchet and come back to work over at D.C. And I said, well, truthfully and honestly, I always thought I had done such a crappy job on Batman that I'd love to get another shot at it. But since I had had dinner with Frank Miller about a week or ten days before and Frank told me his idea for The Dark Knight and I said after Frank's done you can put a period at the end of the Batman sentence for the next 20 years while I'm off by 10 years <laughs> right it, it's still the definitive Batman so Gold said well what about Green Arrow and I said well Green Arrow has always been my favorite character which is which is true my favorite comic book character even including anything I ever created and you know is still tops in my book so he said think about this Green Arrow as an urban hunter and that's where the soul and inspiration for the Longbow Hunters came from right there and for a plot line I reached into my Wayback Machine and pulled out my Black Arrow plot and the, the Black Arrow became Shadow Wow! and right and I just altered things so that instead of a Holocaust survivor, her parents had been Nisei at, uh, during the war. Uh, she had to be younger because this is 12 years later. So they were, they were people who had been in the internment camps and then fell under the influence of the Yakuza and uh, some crooked GIs who were running the camps. And that's, that's how all of that came about. Waste not, want not. Oh, that's fabulous. Uh, the Longbow Hunters was the first work of yours that I ever read. Fell in love with it from the beginning, so it's wonderful to hear about how that book came to be and how that came about. The other part about it that was that was really funny was that one of the subplots that I had had to do with the CIA with a, a guns for drugs operation. And I got a phone call from a New York radio station asking me if I'd be willing to go on the air live and, and talk about it. I went, sure. So what they, what they wanted to ask me was how I beat the story of the Iran Contra Drugs for Guns operation <laughs> into print by six months. Right. And, and I said, look, it's not rocket science. I said, all I did was I took all the various characters, plugged them into things that were going on in the world, and I put them into my storyline and said, okay, now what's the stupidest thing these guys could possibly do if they were just absolutely dead bang certain they'd never get caught? And that's what I wrote. Perfect. That Nobody will ever catch on. Uh, maybe not. I like to think that somebody read The Longbow Hunters and went, hey, wait a minute. This sounds familiar. Hey, Ollie North, explain yourself here. Oh, you're probably right. <laughs> well, I'm really intrigued because the character Shadow is absolutely one of our favorites. Ever since you introduced her, we've always enjoyed seeing her turn up. And we love all of the Japanese locations and Japanese culture you brought into the series through her. And what made you want to bring in that culture and the Japanese locations into the stories through that character? Well, I've, I've always been interested in every different form of archery and I had the opportunity to shoot, shoot a Japanese longbow oh, and wow. it was amazing. I couldn't hit squat with it but the experience was really incredible. 
after shooting for about an hour or so, I actually got my three shots into a cluster maybe six inches apart at 30 yards, and the, the guy who owned the bow was sort of flabbergasted. I was eight feet off the target. I mean, I wasn't anywhere near the actual target itself. They were all in the dirt. He said it doesn't matter. The fact that they're all together in the dirt means that you're doing the same thing over and over again. You're getting the, the method right. And so I was encouraged by that. That that was part of it. And the other, the other thing that got me really intrigued was that there's a, there's a difference in almost every aspect of Japanese archery from what we know as, let's call it Western archery. The method of drawing the bow is different. The, the idea of what you're supposed to be doing is different. In Western archery, the idea is hit the target. In Japanese archery, the idea is to spend a lifetime shooting the one arrow. They say, you don't take the shot, the shot takes the shot. And while I was shooting that Japanese bow, I could feel it just wanting to go. When all of that power is stored up in your body and in the bow and in the arrow, when you release it, it's just this amazing experience. So I, I was looking at contrasts, and I realized that, as in a lot of my characters, when the hero is incomparable at something, right? Uncontested, the world's greatest fill-in-the-blank. It's always really cool to have him come up against somebody who can kick his ass. <laughs> and it's especially cool when that somebody turns out to be a woman. Yes, just, I like it. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's just the, the, the way it goes. My best and most intriguing characters historically in all of my series, I think the, the women have always been more interesting than the men. Well, Shadow is gorgeous, and I love how powerful she is. So I always love it when she shows up in a story. Well, and I know that Ruth agrees with what you were just saying, though, Mike, because it's funny. She was talking just recently about how much she loves all of your strong female characters, mm -hmm. because in every single series that you have, you have not just one, but so many of them. So, And they can be self-sufficient and independent and do so much on their own. It's great. Yeah, that's fabulous. So... I loved hearing about Shadow, and her character has remained part of the Green Arrow mythology ever since you introduced her. It, through Rebirth and, and the New 52 before it, they've changed a lot of things about the character. What have you liked about the fact that you created a character that has remained with Green Arrow long past the time that you worked with it? I think it's great. If it's going to be my contribution to the legacy, I would rank Shadow several notches above the fact that I put the hood on the guy. <laughs> that, was, that was just practicality. It rains a lot in Seattle, and that little Robin Hood cap wasn't going to keep him dry for very long. And that, no, that, that's all there was to it. Well, I think that while I love Shadow and the fact that you have created a, a character with a lot of longevity, but at the same time, it's the changes you made to Oliver Queen and Green Arrow have changed that character ever since as well. And we see that through the Rebirth current series, we see it in the Arrow TV series. So everything that you did with the character during your time on it has remained with that character ever since. So that has to be something that you really are proud of, is it's, that legacy. It's quite satisfying. Yeah. It really is. I would like to ask about the relationship between Oliver and Dinah Lance. I think it's a really important part of the series, and I wondered what your thoughts were about their relationship. I always thought that Ollie and Dinah had the best openly sexual relationship in comics. Everybody knew they were living together, sleeping together. Okay, they were sleeping together. Uh, maybe not living together right at, at the outset. But they got along so well because they respected each other. They had this, this great physical, passionate, sexual relationship going. And when it came right down to it, she could kick his ass, um, <laughs> which is, is sometimes what is necessary with a, a character who is physically superior in some ways or one way or another. It, it's always uh, really neat to see what happens when they come up against someone that they're, they're forced to respect, not just for what they are and who they are, 
but also what they can do. You know, if she's a very successful woman in basically a man's job. Black Canary, up until the uh, Avengers movies, there were not a whole heck of a lot of female characters in comics who were strong and, and well well defined. So their relationship began to change, of course, in Longbow Hunters when I have Ollie going through his somewhat midlife crisis and deciding that the thing to do is suddenly out of the clear blue sky get married. And Dinah doesn't want to. And she tells him, we're in a deadly dangerous business and I'd love to make children with you, but I don't want to make orphans. And so he's got his issues right there. I wanted to do harder edge stories than the bug-eyed monster from outer space kind of stuff. I, I want to bring Oliver Queen very much into the real world. I brought him to Seattle because outside of New York and Chicago, I've only ever lived in three big cities in my life. And Seattle was the current one at the time. I had already done New York for the Sable comics. And frankly, I like Chicago. I really do. But as a setting for heroic adventures, it's not the greatest. Outside of the city, the land is flat. There's not a hill for miles and miles, which is why you have the Great Lakes. It, it's also why you can see the Chicago skyline from 30 miles away. Right. It, it's the only thing that's out there. So if you're going to write about a city, the city becomes one of the characters in your story. It's every bit as important as any of the other characters. The nature of the surroundings define certain things about the nature of the, of the character, which is exactly why Green Arrow wound up with the hood. It's drizzly, rainy a lot of the time in Seattle, and you got you know, from September until May, you got a better than even chance of being rained on. And it's also chilly. So you're not going to be running around with bare arms and wearing leotard. Take it from someone who has worn a leotard. Not on the streets, thank God. Performing, performing with the Seattle Knights. I've had the opportunity to wear green tights. And I was surprised at how cold those things are. <laughs> so, it, it just made sense that he would have heavier trousers and long sleeves on his shirt. <laughs> and outside of that, the other changes that I wanted to do was because I wanted to do hard edge stories. And Denny O'Neill had done a very famous classic story in the Green Lantern Green Arrow book where... Ollie accidentally kills a guy right. and then proceeds to go off his nut, basically secedes from the human race, goes off and joins a monastery someplace, and swears he'll never take another human life. Well, I had just come off Sable, where my high body count for one issue was 137 <laughs> humans. Um, so I, I wanted to be able to draw stories that appealed to me. If he was going to have a tendency toward being street-side vigilante, or even a Robin Hood. Uh, even Robin Hood in the classic stories killed the bad guys when they just absolutely deserved it. Right. So in order to bring this change about in the character of Oliver Queen, I put him into a situation where he would have to make a choice, and that choice would affect him for the rest of his life. Which is where Dunn has gone missing when he finds her. The bad guys have strung her up to a forklift in a warehouse. They've tortured her, and one of them is about to use the knife on her. And Ollie's already demonstrated in the course of the, the setup of the story that he's got enough skill, he could shoot the knife out of the guy's hand. But what does he do? He shoots him square through the heart. Because the senator deserved to die. He just did. But that action, it, it wasn't a throw. It wasn't a toss-off. It became part of who the character was from that time on. Because unlike your, your standard comics where, or even television, where the, the hero gets shot one episode, and the next episode he's walking around as if nothing has happened. In this instance, he makes... A judgment call that in a later story I had compared to 
jumping off a cliff. You stand on the edge of the cliff. Do you jump? Do you not jump? He could have shot the knife out of the guy's hand, but he didn't. And that's the moment where he changes. That's the moment where his life changes from that point on. He can't go back and be the innocent, oh, I'll never kill anybody again in my life, because that's that's not true to the character. And it, and it, or no longer true to the character. And it, no longer necessary for him to find some non-violent way of stopping somebody with a bow and arrow. One of the issues that I have with the, the stories that they're doing right now in, in the new series is that he's got these tranquilizer arrows and he <laughs> shoots somebody with a tranquilizer arrow and they fall asleep. But the design of the arrow is such that it's a broadhead with a vial of some kind of narcotic on the inside of it. I got news for you. If if I'm holding my fingers like you can see me now, and of course you can. I'm so Italian, it's pathetic. A broadhead is an inch and three quarters, maybe two inches long by an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half wide. You make a hole that size, seven or eight inches deep in the human body, and guess what? All the blood leaks out. It just does. <laughs> and I've seen panels where he shoots somebody in the neck with one of these things. Yikes. That, you know, there's the carotid artery. <laughs> yes. There's some anatomy there. There, there, there. There's some anatomy there. So, needless to say, uh, I wasn't consulted on those points. <laughs> or on the fact that the new costume design kind of cracks me up because the arm guard, the bracer that he wears to protect his arm, yeah, they always awesome. put it on the outside of the arm where it does absolutely no good. <laughs> it, it's there to protect your arm from the bowstring so you don't wind up with a gigantic purple spot on the inside of your arm. But there you go. Oh. That's a big mistake. My buddy and I are great at solving all the problems of the world. In fact, we've done it on, on more than one occasion in a bar late at night. And unfortunately, just at the point where we had figured out all the answers, we had one more drink to celebrate. And <laughs> after that, couldn't remember what the solution to the problems were. So we, oh, no. we, we, could, we continually try to reenact the moment in hopes that the memory will come flooding back. Oh, that oh, is I too funny. <laughs> Well, I've got to ask, I love hearing you talk about the Rebirth series right now as well, but you had a really long run on Green Arrow. I mean, you were there through the miniseries and 80 issues and some other spinoff miniseries. Did you feel satisfied with the amount of time that you spent with the character? Uh, satisfied, but not to the point where I was glad to leave it behind. The only real reason I did was because I had the opportunity to create my own series for Image Comics, which was Shaman's Tears. And back in those days, you couldn't turn your back on that kind of cash. You just couldn't. If I, if I had my brothers, I'd, I'd love to go back to Green Arrow. Yeah, yeah, we'd love that too. Well, you are back on Green Arrow, sort of, because you're doing 12 variant covers for the current yes, I am. Uh, Rebirth series. So tell us a little bit about how that came about and how much fun you're having being back on the character doing those variant covers. I have a friend who owns a comic shop and he was calling me one day to talk about something else out of the clear blue sky and he told me about the, the very cover program that DC was doing and he told me that Neil Adams was doing the Green Arrow covers for the variants and it sounded like a good idea to me so I got hold of Dan DeDio and said you know what do I have to do to get in on some of that variant action and he went oh as a matter of fact I think we've got some openings coming up here pretty quick. Next thing I know, i got a contact from Mark Chiarello, the uh, art director over there. And he said, yeah, Neil's off the Green Arrow variants, starting with issue number 18. So this is the second time I'm following Neil Adams on Green Arrow. That's right. Wow. Well, and the first issue, issue 18, just came out last week. And here at your table, you have prints of your first four. So that's exciting to see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun you know, coming back to the character after all this time. And it's, I have to tell you, it's like going home. Yeah. <laughs> it, it just really is. Feels right, feels good. Oh, that's That's fabulous. great to hear. You've mentioned before 
that your love of Green Arrow goes back to your love of Robin Hood, which is a favorite character of mine. What are some of your favorite Robin Hood movies and books? Well, naturally, the Errol Flynn version of Robin Hood is really incredible, but my all-time favorite Robin Hood movie is Robin and Mary. Oh, oh Sean with Connery. Sean Connery. Yes. Let's not forget Audrey Hepburn. No, let's yes. not. <laughs> and and as, as much as it varied from the original story, the spirit of it was still the same. And to my way of thinking, it's the, one of the most beautiful romantic stories I've ever seen on screen. The old warrior approaching the end of his life and just wanting to get out there one last time and prove that he, he isn't too old. And the woman who loves him so much that she can't bear to watch him go through this again and again and again. Now, it's a sacrifice on both their parts. And if it doesn't bring out the hankies, you probably don't have a hanky anywhere <laughs> in, in sight. It's, it's just a, a, a terrific romantic story. And, and like I say, my favorite. My favorite Robin Hood book i got to say that the Howard Pyle version for me is pretty much definitive. I got a call from Donning Press years ago wanting me to re-illustrate Howard Pyle's Robin Hood. And I went, are you nuts? <laughs> of course I'll do it. Of course you have to take the job because you're never going to get offered that opportunity again. It just is not going to happen. So you do it knowing full well that no matter what you do, it's going to suck. <laughs> it's, 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 it's sort of sort of, sort of like the guy who directed the shot-for-shot shot remake of Psycho. Oh, yes. Or, yes. or the, the, the poor guy who I'm, I'm sure was a, a terrific writer in his own right gets tapped to write the sequel to Gone with the Wind. Right. <laughs> or the sequel to... Yeah, I guess it was a prequel. Casablanca. Yeah. David, I want to say David, David Spade, but it wasn't. David it was Soul. David Soul, yeah. yes. <laughs> Can you imagine David Spade? <laughs> oh, God. Well, I can imagine your reaction about being asked to re-illustrate the Howard Pyle book, but your illustrations for the Howard Pyle book are fabulous, and we're lucky to have a copy of that book. You say all the right kind of stuff. <laughs> i got to mention uh, one other Robin Hood favorite story uh, of mine which is the Robin of Sherwood television series. Oh, yes. Co-starring several now friends of mine. I uh, had the pleasure of meeting Michael Prade and Jason Connery, who both played Robin Hood on the series. Michael to start, Jason to to finish off, along with Ray Winston, well-known co-star of Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Scorsese's movie The Departed, and one of my all-time best buddies now, Mark Ryan, yes. who played Nazir. Mark actually created that character, and to his credit, he actually created the first Arabic character to ever appear in any Robin Hood story ever. And now you can't see a Robin Hood movie without having it feature some character who's Arabic. So there's, there's his contribution, like I put the hood on Green Arrow. The way we met was, was really pretty funny. They were attending a, a convention in Seattle, and I was there because I was doing James Bond at the time. And we struck up a conversation out of a mutual affection for not just the Robin Hood character, but uh, Mark was working on a, a screenplay for a film he called Pendragon, which is, I think, still a great idea, the return of King Arthur and in modern times and uh, I asked what they had seen of the city and they said nothing we've been here since Tuesday and we've seen the hotel I said I'll tell you what I'll get a car and we'll all go out to dinner at the Space Needle and hit a couple of clubs on one condition and Mark said what's that and I said for the whole night no one gets to talk about Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> You're on, man. So, and, and, and we've been close buddies ever since. I'm really happy to hear that. Mark Ryan, I believe, worked with you, though, on a, a comic that unfortunately never came about, didn't he? We worked on several. We yes. collaborated on uh, Green Arrow, 
story for the annual. One of the annuals, yeah. He's been my advisor consultant on things like James Bond, Permission to Die. He is the real James Bond, by the way. He just doesn't show it around the edges so much. <laughs> and then we collaborated on The Pilgrim, which yes, was uh, short lived. Unfortunately, the company that was publishing it ran out of money and just never bothered returning the phone calls when we really were desperately wondering what's going on, mate. So Mark decided to pull the pin on that. And it's too bad because uh, I think it still has some legs. It's the kind of story I saw it as a like a Frankenstein story where the creature is created out of the mental energies of a bunch of different people. And when he's basically set loose in, in the world during World War II, he has no guidance, no idea who he is, where he came from, what his purpose is. So he's basically like anybody else. He's, he's trying to find his way. And he has essentially forgotten what his true origins are until circumstances come about and one day he begins to remember. I wanted to come back just briefly to the Errol Flynn Adventures of Robin Hood because I know that Howard Hill was the archer in that, famously known as the world's greatest archer, and you brought him into the Green Arrow origin story later on, and I wanted you to tell us about what inspired you to do that. Oh yeah, I've always been a big admirer of Howard Hill. In fact, I own three of his bows. Oh, wow. Wow. I, I own one of his back quivers. And an old friend of his, when the Longbow Hunters came out and that poster was first released to the comic shops for promotion, happened to be wandering down the street in San Francisco, spotted the poster, went in, got a copy of the book, and tracked me down and sent me one of Howard Hill's personal arrows oh, that he had wow. had as a keepsake, which is... Yeah, a, a real thrill. Yeah, Howard Hill could do all of that stuff. When they were auditioning archers for the trick shots back in the day, they did as much of that stuff live on camera yes. as they possibly could. And they needed somebody who could split an arrow on demand, and they needed somebody who could shoot and hit a target on a man's chest, a, a plate that was it was basically... A 12-inch plate of steel with an inch and a half of balsa wood in the front to have something for the arrow to stick in. And these guys used to get paid an extra $250 to have Howard shoot them. The most difficult shot he said he ever made was the movie called They Died With Their Boots On, where he's playing an Indian chasing a cavalry officer, and he had to shoot the guy from a galloping horse. He had two horses, and he used a... A bow with a draw of 100 pounds to get that shot uh, to make sure that the flight time of the trajectory was as flat and short as possible. And the guy who received that arrow said there was no doubt about when it was time to fall off his horse because <laughs> when the arrow hit him, it felt like he got hit in the spine with a ball peen hammer. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah that'll, that'll, that'll kind of do it for you. So I, I, I always like that. I like the, the stories about how when uh, he was doing the audition, first they asked him to shoot as, as many bullseyes on a target as possible in 30 seconds. There were 12 archers lined up, and Howard shot 12 bullseyes, but he shot one on each of the other guy's targets <laughs> and his, which is ba basically messing with your mind, right? When, you, when you're aiming and all of a sudden there's a, an arrow in the middle of your target, <laughs> it, it's going to be a bit of a distraction. Oh, so, how impressive. And then they asked him to uh, cut a rope, a free-hanging rope, because that's one of, one of the stunts. And everybody who shot at the rope hit it. Now, Howard had already basically won the job, uh, but he, he asked the, the director if he could come back the next day and take one shot. And I yeah, went, okay, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained, what the heck. Give him the opportunity. And he went home, and that night he <laughs> welded up an arrowhead that, instead of being the V with the point facing forward, it faced backwards. Uh, so that he had this long wedge sharpened on the inside, yes. and he spent the night measuring 
distances. He would stand back and take a shot, and he finally calculated the distance that he had to be standing to make that shot so that the arrow would rotate in midair and come in flat. So he showed up the next day with a piece of chalk and his measuring tape, measured off the distance, put a chalk mark on the floor, and cut the arrow the first shot. Wow. <laughs> and thereby hangs the tail, and thereby didn't hang Little John or whoever it was in the movie. <laughs> um, so the, that kind of stuff I, I really loved. And the idea that a guy like Howard Hill could do this with a real bow and real arrows made sense to bring that into the Green Arrow mythos. Like, how does a guy like Oliver Queen learn to shoot a bow? Well, you know, Howard Hill was was in that part of the world uh, back in the day. He would have been a celebrity guest and, uh, and, and a lot of yachts and, and things like that. So why not have him on board showing Oliver how, at least the rudiments of how to shoot an arrow? That's fabulous. I loved his appearance in that story. I did too. In closing, we want to thank you for taking time to talk with us today. Is there anything else you'd like to say to your fans before we go? If you're anywhere near Lexington, come down and see me. I'll be here all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Mike, for taking this time with us, and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. The end of the world is approaching. Soon the planet will be engulfed in a nuclear Armageddon, and the only people that can prevent this from happening are considered to be the greatest villains of all time. The only thing standing in their way is the Justice League. In 2005... Uh, wait a second, are, are we sure about that date this time? Yeah, it's 2005. We're sure this time. Let's just be perfectly clear. I hate all of you so much. Okay, good. Got that. All right. In 2005, DC Comics began publishing a 12-issue bi-monthly comic called Justice. Justice. Written by Jim Kruger with art by Alex Ross and Doug Braithwaite, this series was essentially a Super Friends for adults. And now another group of Super Friends has come together to discuss all 12 issues in a podcasting crossover called J.L. May 2017. The excitement begins on the April 30th episode of the Fire and Water podcast and continues into Supermates, the Idle Head of Diabolu podcast, Views from the Long Box, the Pulp to Pixel podcast, the Lantern cast, the Shazam cast, Comic Reflections, the Silver and Gold podcast, the Power of Fishnets, Waiting for Doom, and Justice's First Dawn, J.L. J. L. May, 2017. Last year, they covered the beginning of the Justice League. This year, they discuss and review the League's toughest battle. The coverage begins on April 30th on the Fire and Water Podcast, located at fireandwaterpodcast.com. We want to sincerely thank Mike Grell for taking the time for that interview with us. He is always such a terrific gentleman and truly appreciates his fans. Getting the chance to talk to him about Green Arrow was a terrific way to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Longbow Hunters. It was a treat to hear him share all of that history and those great stories. And we know that like us, there are many fans who are very excited about those new Green Arrow covers he's drawing. We are so happy to have gotten to know Mike over the last few years, and we're always excited whenever we have the opportunity to see him. Mike was drawing the entire time during the interview, first finishing a commission of Green Lantern and then starting a commission of John Sable. It's amazing that he can carry on a conversation and tell great stories while drawing beautiful works of art. He is truly talented. To keep up with all the latest news and information, be sure to check out MikeGrail.com, where he posts photos and updates on upcoming conventions. There you can see photos of fans showing off their Mike Grail commissions and others showing off their Green Arrow and Warlord cosplay. And you can see a great photo of Spencer Wilding, who plays Darth Vader in Rogue One, wearing Mike Grell's hat, along with a list of a few other stars who have tried on his hat over the years, including Billy D. Williams and Margot Kidder. Plus, if you're interested in getting a commission from Mike Grell, be sure to visit Scott Cress at CatskillComics.com 
You can get original art from Mike Grell and many other great comic creators, and you can also arrange commissions with Mike. If you're a fan of Mike Grell, Green Arrow, and Robin Hood, here are a few other resources that you will want to check out. We definitely recommend that you join the Mike Grell page on Facebook, run by Gus Ceballos. It's a great place to connect with other fans and features tons of great Mike Grell art. Jeff Messer, who does the Geek Brain podcast, is a friend of Mike's and has some great interviews on his show. Professor Allen at the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network is a Mike Grell fan and occasionally covers his comics on his shows. The Comic Book Ben website features tons of great comic book information, including reviews of the current Green Arrow comics by fellow Mike Grell fan Philip Schweier. And while the show is currently on hiatus, fans of the Green Arrow should check out past episodes of the Emerald Archer podcast from Ed and Nick Moore of Till Productions. Black Canary fans should try out the Feathers and Foes podcast with Ashford, Leah, and Mark, as well as the Powers of Fishnets podcast with host Ryan Daly. And Robin Hood fans have a couple of great resources as well. Alan Wright is a Mike Grell fan and runs the fantastic website BoldOutlaw.com, focused on the adventures of Robin Hood. And there is the excellent Trail of Robin of Sherwood community on Facebook dedicated to the Robin of Sherwood TV show. They have lots of great information and even maps of filming locations for the series. And while not related to Green Arrow, fans of Mike Grell will love the blog The Hollow World by Jeffrey Willis that is dedicated to the worlds of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Pellucidar and Mike Grell's guitarist from the Warlord series. In other Robin Hood-related news, we recently had the opportunity to record a guest spot on the movie review podcast Is It Jaws? with host Paul Spataro from the Two True Freaks podcast network. There we talked about the classic film The Adventures of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland, and Basil Rathbone. It's a favorite of ours, and it was great to discuss it with Paul. And we want to thank our friend Keith G. Baker, who gave us a great gift of The Adventures of Robin Hood on Blu-ray with extras we had never seen. Keith also gave us the biography of Howard Hill that helped us be ready for some fun conversations with Mike Grell about the world's greatest archer. We also want to thank Ryan Daly, who invited us to be guests on an upcoming episode of the Powers of Fishnets podcast. It's part of the special J.L. May crossover event covering the Justice miniseries by Alex Ross. We had the chance to discuss Justice Issue 10, featuring Green Arrow and Black Canary. Look for the episode in late May. Thanks, Ryan. Next up is listener feedback. We received some great comments on episode 14 and have several people to thank for supporting our show. And we'll give you an update on our Warlord Dreamcast contest, where you could win an item signed by Mike Grell. We received a terrific note and photo from Jimmy Simpson following our review of the Warlord issue number 34. He wrote, I've been waiting for you to reach this point. It is one of my favorite Warlord covers and probably the favorite of the covers I own. And he attached a photo of the original drawing that he has kindly let us post on social media. You have to take a look at it. Jimmy has developed an outstanding Mike Grell art collection. It includes covers to Shaman's Tears, Star Slayer, Maggie the Cat, Green Arrow, and Bar Sinister. Let me tell you about the piece that I want to quote, unquote, borrow the most to hang on my wall for a while, if you don't mind, Jimmy. It is the painting Mike did for the cover of the Howard Pyle book. That's right. Jimmy owns that amazing cover, and it is stunning. We're excited to let you know that Jimmy has made it easy for everyone to take a look at his entire Mike Grell collection by creating an album on Flickr. You'll find the link in the show notes. Take a look, and don't be surprised if it makes your jaw drop open several times. Thank you, Jimmy, for sharing all of that with us. Your collection is astonishing. And if that tempts you to start or add to your very own Mike Grell collection, just remember to contact Scott Kress over at Catsville Comics. That's what our friend Brian Mulvey did recently when he picked up the original rust for the alternate cover that Mike did for Green Arrow issue number 19. That's the alternate cover featuring Green Arrow and Speedy standing back to back with their bows in hand, ready for action. It's a wonderful cover. Speaking of art, colorist Marcus David commented on a photo of a set of John Sables that we posted on Facebook. He wrote, Out of the foggy past, I colored the one on the right. That turned out to be the cover to John Sable number 36. The cover shows Mike Blackman painting a portrait of John Sable, and the colors are terrific. Thanks for letting us know, Marcus. Chris and Reggie over at the Cosmic Treadmill podcast featured an in-depth discussion of the Longbow Hunters in their episode number 34. There's great conversation about the character of Green Arrow, the historical background for the Seattle setting, and continuity. They know their Mike Grell facts and did a great job sharing lots of information on the show. Please give it a listen. We know you'll enjoy it. The link will be in our show notes. 
Professor Allen of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network wrote in saying, Just listen to episode 14. I haven't read that particular issue of Sable in a very long time, but as you were summarizing it, it all came back to me. I remember the intensity of the story, with Sable stalking the White Widow, and the irony of her eventual end. Loved the story, and loved how you brought it back to my memory. Joe Crawford of the blog for the Non-Discerning Reader wrote, Another great episode. I especially enjoyed the Green Arrow and Warlord summaries. Joel Cochran commented on the last Green Arrow, saying, It may be my favorite story during the Mike Grail run. Alan Wright of the Bold Outlaw website also commented on that Green Arrow story from episode 14, saying, Just wanted to mention how wonderful it was to read the Witch Hunt arc back in the day. I first came to Robin of Sherwood when it aired in reruns on PBS. The show had been retitled for North America as just simply Robin Hood. A few friends from school knew about it, and there were a couple of articles in Starlog magazine, but generally there was very little information to be had about the show. If you were even aware of the original British title, you were in the know. And so, here in the Green Arrow comic was Part 2's subtitle, Ollie of Sherwood, and the appearance by Hearn the Hunter. Yes, Mike Grell knew Robin of Sherwood existed. And a special thanks goes to Alan Wright for all the promotions he's done of the show on social media, and he deserves an extra special shout-out for making a donation to the Hero Initiative after learning about the charity on our show. Pat Sampson, Jared Albrich, and Jason Albrich of the Long Box Crusade podcast gave episode 14 a shout-out, commenting on the awesome guests who've been covering the Legion of Superheroes on the episode. Thanks, guys. Ange of the Supergirl Comic Box Commentary wrote, Great episode as always. First, that John Sable story is crazy. Talk about a horrible ending. Reminds me of early Steve Ditko stories where people like Mr. A let criminals drown. The fact that in some tacit way, Sable was responsible for her injury can't be forgotten. His presence drove her to try to jump over the wall, but his dropping in to sort of rub salt in the wounds of her paralysis is pretty gritty. And I love both the main stories in the Legion section. I will say that the Legion clone bank is initially used as the foundation for the Legionnaire clones in the five-year-later run. And yes, Devron was supposed to be an African-American in that Legion story, but was recolored at the editor's insistence. Thanks for confirming that for us, Ange. Martin Gray of the blog Too Dangerous for a Girl was glad to see the new Legion print by Mike Grell that we posted, and he noted the famous origins of the scene. Rich Claybaugh commented on the print, saying that Grell and Cockrum's Legion of Superheroes were awesome. We agree, Rich. Martin Gray also shared a photo of a new Green Arrow cover by Mike Grell. It's gorgeous with the Seattle Space Needle and Moon in the background. And Victor Lanza sent us a snapshot of that exact issue in his hand when he picked it up for his collection. I love seeing fellow fans sharing Mike's art online. And Victor mentioned he is very familiar with Seattle and also let us know that Emerald City Comic Con is awesome. We've wanted to attend that con for a long time, and now we know when we do, we can meet up with fellow fan Victor. And of course, we'll look for some Green Arrow landmarks. I wonder if we can find Sherwood Florist. It's convention season, and Mike Grell has been making the rounds to different cons. James Warrington met Mike Grell at East Coast City Comic Con. He posted some great photos on the Warlord World's Facebook page, so be sure to take a look. We were excited to see a shot of James with Mike at his booth one of Mike at a panel, and the terrific selection of books that James got signed by Mike at the show. Those included Green Arrow, John Sable, Warlord, and even Bar Sinister. Jeff Messer of the Geek Brain Popcast and his family caught up with Mike Grell at the South Carolina Comic Con. They shared some great photos and a fun story. Jeff's daughter was dressed as Negan from The Walking Dead, complete with baseball bat. But Mike noticed that the bat didn't include the barbed wire. So he borrowed the bat for a few moments and customized it by drawing barbed wire on it. Needless to say, she was very happy with that. We want to give a big thanks to Kyle Benning of the excellent King Size Comics Giant Size Fun podcast for posting online that our show is fantastic and recommending our podcast to others during the hashtag tripod campaign on Twitter. Thank you, Kyle. Fellow fan Nethead did a great promo for us on social media too, letting others know that he was listening to Warlord Worlds episode 14. And thanks as always to Brian Hackney for his consistent support of our show on Twitter too. And we want to thank Chris of Bat Books for Beginners for his excellent support of our show on Twitter. And Jerry, also of Bat Books for Beginners, commented that in Batman Mask, Mike Grell expertly mixed Batman, Poe, and Phantom of the Opera. I loved it. That is a great issue, and maybe we should invite Chris and Jerry on our show to review Batman Mask. Jeffrey Willis has a great new post on his Hollow World blog. It includes photos from a Wonder Woman storyline called Land of the Lost, written by Phil Jimenez with illustrations by Roy Allen Martinez. 
The story deals with Wonder Woman and includes her traveling to Skataris and meeting the Warlord. Be sure to check it out. And a big thanks to Chris Sheehan of the Fun Cosmic Treadmill podcast and the blog Chris is on Infinite Earths. He did a wonderful post about the first issue special featuring the first appearance of the Warlord. In that post, he included some great compliments about our podcast. It's a terrific blog and everyone should read it regularly and we'll include a link to that post in our show notes. Thanks, Chris. In addition to all of the great promotions our Warlord friends do for us, it is great to know that they really look out for us. Here's a couple of examples. Wendy Freeman of the Double Page Spread podcast shared a link to a great video of a John Sable 3D creation by Todd Reese. He uses comic covers to make shadow box art. And Terry Moore of Till Productions' The Mighty Thorcast sent us the link to an amazing video of a Warlord 3D artwork also by Todd Reese. A sincere thank you to those two lovely ladies for sharing this terrific art. The effort and time that must go into the construction of these is incredible. His Facebook page is called The Unique 3D Shadow Box Art of Todd R. Reese. We follow it and recommend that others do as well. And he's even made shadow box art for Mike Grell in the past. We'll put a link in the show notes. And we want to send a special thanks to Russell Burbage for featuring the Warlord Worlds episode number 14 on the Legion of Superbloggers, which features a review of the Legion of Superheroes number 206 by Mike Lane and included an introduction of our podcast and highlighted the Legion of Superheroes segments. Russell said lots of nice things about the show, and we really appreciate it. We'll include a link to the post in the show notes. Leslie Trigg wrote in saying, I'm thankful for a wonderful podcast. Love your reviews of one of my favorite comic creators, Iron Mike Grill. And that helps us segue into details on our current contest, because Leslie sent in a great entry for our Dreamcast contest. We'll share Leslie's list along with the other entries in our next episode. There's still time to participate in the contest, so here are the details. Just think of what actors, past or present, that you would like to cast in a Warlord movie or TV show. Who do you think would be best to portray Travis Morgan, Tara, Machiste, Mariah, Shakira, Demos, or any other characters from that world that you'd like to see on screen? And then send your cast list for the Warlord by email at warlordworlds at gmail.com using the subject Warlord Dreamcast. Everyone who submits a Dreamcast list will be entered into a drawing and we'll give away a prize signed by Mike Grell in our next episode. We'll close this section with an iTunes review from Jerry of Bat Books for Beginners. Jerry wrote, Darren and Ruth have done it again. I was just turned on to Trekker Talk and loved it, so decided to give Warlord Worlds a try. I'm glad I did. If you are a comic book fan, you can't go wrong with Warlord Worlds. Great recaps, interviews, and more. Their love of the creators they talk about comes through loud and clear. Thank you, Jerry, and we hope you'll all come back next time when we'll be getting back to the basics and talking about Mike Grell Comics. Next, we want to extend our thanks to everyone who supported us on social media since the last episode. These are people who liked or shared our Facebook or Tumblr pages or retweeted our tweets. If we miss a name, let us know and we'll include it next time. And please forgive us if we mispronounce your name. If that happens, just let us know and we'd be happy to correct that next time as well. 20th Century Geek Podcast, Adam Stabelli, Alan Wright from BoldOutlaw.com, Ange of the Supergirl Comic Box Commentary Blog, Ashford of Feathers and Foes and Straight Outta Gallifrey, BC Fan 101, Brian Hackney, Brian Mulvey, Bronze Age Babies, Chris Carnes of Bat Books for Beginners, Chris Sheehan of Cosmic Treadmill Podcast, Clinton Robson of the Coffee and Comics Blog and Podcast, Comics in the Golden Age with Mike and Chris, Colin Stapleton from the Worst Comics Podcast Ever, DC in the 80s, Diablo Frank of the Idle Head of Diablo Martian Manhunter Blog, Doug Juija from the Doom Patrol Blog, My Greatest Adventure 80, Dr. G, Man of Nerdology, of Pulp to Pixel Podcast. Dread, Ed and Terry Moore of Till Productions. Eric Mannix of Out of the Fridge and Pages for All Ages. Jerry from Bat Books for Beginners. Holly M of Holly Wrote It. James Warrington. Jeff Messer of the Geek Brain Podcast. Jeffrey Brown. Jeffrey Willis from the Hollow World Blog. Jester Head. Jimmy Simpson. Joe Crawford of the Blog for the Non-Discerning Reader. Joel Cochran, John Baker, Justice's First Dawn with Mike Peacock. Karen Williams of Between the Pages. Artist Ken Solo. Kyle Benning of King Size Comics Giant Size Fun. The Legion of Super Bloggers. Leslie Trigg. The Lone Box Crusade Podcast with Pat and Jared. Artist and colorist Marcus David. Mark Adams of the Mark's Mess Podcast. 
Mark Sweeney from the On the Gun blog and podcast in Comics Couplets, Martin Gray of the blog Too Dangerous for a Girl, Matches Balone, Michael Lane of the Comics in the Golden Age podcast, Mike Alvarezzi, Nethead, Nicholas Prom of Comics Reflections, Pat Sampson of the Lombox Crusade, Paul Hicks of the Waiting for Doom podcast, Paul Spataro of Back to the Bins and Is It Jaws, Phil G., Professor Allen of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network, Reggie, co-host of the Cosmic Treadmill Podcast, Rick Claybaugh, the Rolled Spine Podcast, Russell Burbage of the Legion of Superbloggers, Ryan Daly of the Power of Fishnets and Midnight the Podcasting Hour, Simon Barre Brisbois, Spencer Holmes, Steve Stellers, Stephen McKay, Talk Nerdy to Me, Tim Wallace of Court Industries Blue Beetle Blog and the podcast Beetlemania, Tony Greenall, the Two True Freaks Podcast Network, Victor Lonza, Wednesday Comics, and Wendy Freeman of the podcast Double Page Spread. Before we go, we want to provide our contact information. Please let us know your thoughts through email, Facebook, or Twitter. If you want to contact us directly, please send an email to warlordworlds at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr using the name Warlord Worlds, and you can visit warlordworlds.com for links to our social media pages. And you can always listen to the show through iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. You can also find the show on YouTube as part of the Rad Adventures Podcast Network. I'm sure you get it. Ruth and Darren, R-A-D, Rad. And on the Rad Adventures YouTube channel, you will find all of the episodes to all of our podcasts, including Warlord Worlds, as well as Trekker Talk about 23rd Century Bounty Hunter Mercy St. Clair by Ron Randall, and Xenozoic Xenophiles about the Cadillacs and Dinosaurs series Xenozoic Tales by Mark Schultz. If you like the show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. Every review helps the podcast be more likely to show up in search results. And on YouTube, we hope you'll subscribe to the channel and give us some likes on the videos. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you will come back next time for another new episode of Warlord Worlds. Warlord Worlds is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. For more information, visit comicspodcast.com. We are not affiliated with DC Comics or Mike Grell. The views expressed on the show are solely ours. Music is taken from the album Royalty-Free Instrumental Music for Movies and Websites. We make no money from this podcast and no copyright infringement is intended. Mm-hmm.